Thank you very much, Ilker. Yes, I've known Ilker, it seems like forever. And uh, I'm among the people who have enjoyed knowing Ilker very much. Uh, I'm especially delighted to have been uh, invited to give this um, lecture, the Richard M. Sart lecture. When I came to GSA to Carnegie Mellon as a PhD student, uh, Dick Sart was the dean, and he was the dean for the first three out of the four years I spent as a PhD student. Um, then uh, in the fourth year, uh, Dick Sart was elevated to the president of the university. And uh, I regard Dick Sart as the greatest dean of, uh, ever at, at GSA. GSA. Um, there have been a number of deans. Uh, I would say the only one who came close to the statue, stature of Dick Sart was Ken Dunn. Um, uh, rumor was that Dick Side would come in on Saturdays and make the rounds of the building and uh, see uh, which faculty were in the office working that Saturday. Um, imagine anyone trying to do that today. Uh, it, it was a great place to be. And uh, as, uh, as Ilke said, uh, the environment was great for new assistant professors. It was great for for uh, PhD students to do, try to do innovative things. Um, my theme today is related to one of the things for which we, Prescott and I, got the prize. Um, many have pointed out that there's a great deal of uncertainty in, in um, in policy making across the world. And uh, where I will come from, I will try to uh, look at this uncertainty uh, from a particular theoretical point of view. Um, and it has to do with the importance of uh, policy consistency. Um, what's important to remember is that most growth prom promoting decisions um, are very forward looking. To be done well, they, ha they have to have a, a view of the future policy environment. Uh, when someone uh, dis thinks about building a large factory, a uh, factory that will produce for 10 or 20 years maybe, it's, it's important to know what the, or have an idea of what future tax rates will be, for example. Um, and, uh, and similar arguments can be made about holdings of government debt, um, the investment in human capital. These are all very forward-looking decisions. And so for, that, for that reason, um, future policy, if we knew future policy, it affects decisions today. Um, now, the difficulty is uh, the following finding from economic theory, to, to which um, Ilke allu alluded. Um, optimal government policy is time and consistent. So there will be a, a um, temptation for governments, even if they have the best of intentions, to, uh, to change policy in the future, and that can be very bad for society. Uh, the implications of that could be um, manifold. It, it could be that consistently bad policy is being carried out in, in uh, a particular nation, or it could be that seemingly ben uh, benign policy is, is being pursued, but there's a great deal of uncertainty. Will, will the government stick to that policy? And if once that uncertainty arises, that will affect decisions today. Um, <clears throat> so 
my view is that a deep understanding of, of this problem um, could be of value in thinking about um, what's going to happen in different parts of the world depending on the nature of, of governments, the, uh, the predictability of governments, the institutions in, in those nations, etc. Et uh, I'll, I'll touch on different parts of the world as uh, examples. Um, I, I, I see I've listed uh, some in uh, Latin America, United States. Um, I'll comment on the European Union, the Eurozone, uh, even a non-member of the Eurozone, uh, Norway if I have time, China, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Um, I may not have time for all of that, but uh, let, let's start with um, some idea about what's going on in the world. So here's, here's, a, here's a picture of GDP per capita in a number of nations. It seems like a rather idiosyncratic collection. Um, uh, the, uh, the real GDP per capita is one of the measures of welfare in, in a nation. Obviously, not, not necessarily the best measure of welfare, but it's, it's something that's being collected, data collected all over the world. So one can make some sort of comparison about what's going on. The United States appears at the top of this picture. Um, modesty kept me from putting Norway in the picture. Um, of course, if I had put Qatar in the picture, that would have dwarfed everything else in the, in in this chart. So uh, um, now, uh, so there are some interesting nations here. This this goes from uh, by 1950 till uh, till uh, very recently. Uh, in in con so this is real in 2005. Constant dollars. Um, if you want to know where we, we are today, you have to multiply by 1.15, roughly, which is, there's been a 15% growth in prices so, since 2005. Uh, so some, some of these nations have grown fairly fast. Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and then some nations not very fast, like uh, Mexico, Chile, um, uh, pretty flat pictures. I'll get back to s some of these. Um, at the bottom is China. Sometimes it surprises people that China ends up that low because uh, there's much talk about how dominant China is in the world. And of course the reason for that is if you multiply a small number, like GDP per capita, by a large number of people, then uh, you, 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 get, you get a large quantity. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll comment also on China later on. Um, and then I decided to throw in a couple of very young countries, countries that uh, were created after the breakup of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, Azerbaijan and, and Kazakhstan. These are, these are both resource-rich nations, and among resource-rich nations, they've, they've done uh, quite well. One thing to remember in reading this chart, this is not on proportional scale. This is so that it's easy to compare across nations, and uh, it's important to remember that uh, if um, a, a given steepness of a curve, uh, when you're far down in the picture, it corresponds to a much larger per percent growth than the same steepness higher up. Later on, I'll have some uh, charts on proportional scale. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with a little elementary background. Uh, 
central to just about all of macroeconomics these days is, is uh, what we call the aggregate production function. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, by the way, this is going to be my only uh, use of mathematical symbols. Um, so it says that GDP, real GDP, is a function of uh, the two major inputs, capital and labor. Capital and labor inputs, uh, so a function of uh, capital uh, and labor. Labor, of course, uh, must be interpreted not just as the workforce, but in such a way that the um, that the worker's skills are weighted. So th these would be work uh, uh, quality weighted uh, measures of the of the labor input. Um, in front of that function is uh, there is a Z. And Z that stands for the uh, technology technology level, um, and, and that's crucial to growth of nations. The uh, the technology, so crucial that uh, of uh, of uh, technological pro progress, I've put in bold face and uh, for visual uh, impression. I've indicated which way technological pro progress is supposed to go. Um, so, so Z is the main driving force for uh, for growth of nations. Uh, it, it comes from innovation, the result of research and development. Um, to, uh, and of course, leads to future future growth, future higher productivity. Uh, but to take advantage of this technological advance, we need capital. Uh, we need investment in new capital, both uh, physical and human human capital. Um, and here's where the government comes into the picture. It turns out the government can be. A factor it can be a positive or a negative factor in in uh, the extent of growth of nation, in the extent to which these uh, forces um, are in play. Um, I'll uh, I'll get back to a couple of examples of uh, of nations where uh, th these are a couple of the most extreme examples I know about. They happen to be countries which I've, I've studied, Argentina and Ireland. Um, I suppose I could have omitted the parentheses and then you could have guessed which ones would be positive and which one would be negative, but uh, there probably wouldn't have been much doubt about that. Um, so so uh, let me just give a, some recent examples of policy, just that you get in the mood of, of thinking of uh, what kind of policy we might be talking about. I, I'll be talking a lot about fiscal policy um, because fiscal policy, uh, most economists would agree that fiscal policy potentially has much greater impact on the growth of nations than monetary policy. I know uh, many journalists th don't seem to agree with that, but uh, but it, it's uh, everything we know about economic theory would suggest that fiscal policy has to be cr uh, the crucial aspect of, uh, of either a, a positive factor or a negative factor in uh, in the growth of nations. Uh, so uh, here here are some examples of uh, of uh, policy measures that were tried in. After the um, the financial crisis, the United States tried a temporary uh, tax rebate. I would think that most of my undergraduates would understand that that's likely to have little effect. A temporary tax rate rebate a theory would suggest most of it would be saved. Little a little would affect. The um, the growth of the nation in in um, 
in the period in which it took place. Stimulus spending, well, well-planned spending, of course, can be uh, useful. Spending on infrastructure, education, research, uh, items that improve the productivity of a nation. Um, such projects could be worth the extra debt uh, taken on, but much of the stimulus spending probably was um, poorly planned and not very effective and uh, contributed to uh, the growth of a debt problem for the United States that had been boiling for, for quite a while. Uh, so that such, such measures just for the purpose of stimulus probably are not a good idea. Um, especially for a country with budget problems. So, I gave you some elementary uh, th theoretical background from uh, economics, uh, particularly the production function and uh, the key factors for growth of nations. Um, here's a more difficult uh, theoretical perspective, but that's crucial to what, what I'll be talking about today. Let's, let's think about an ideal situation. Uh, economists like to uh, simplify things, abstract from uh, unnecessary complications, just to get our ideas clear. And, and so imagine that the nation was governed by a benign policymaker, who had, had a way of quantifying, or um, in, in a mathematical way, quantifying the welfare of its citizens today and indefinitely far into the future. A policy, the optimal policy would obviously be the plan, the policy f that would maximize that welfare. Um, and. Um, Suppose he was able to work that out. The theoretical result is that that policy would be inconsistent over time. Sometime in the future, any time in the future, there, there would be a temptation to change that policy. If, if the policymaker uh, fell for that temptation, uh, especially if he did so time and time again, uh, what we found was that could be very, very bad for the economy. Uh, and so that suggests there's a need for a commitment mechanism, one, a, a way to convince people that this is the policy that will be pursued uh, to remove the uncertainty about whether or not it will be pursued. Now, so I said this, uh, I said this was uh, the most ideal situation. And this is kind of a little pessimistic because this says, even under this ideal circumstance, there's a, this problem of time inconsistency. Now imagine the real political world, uh, the way politics work in practice, the problem is likely to be even greater in, in, in that kind of world. Um, now, you may, you may ask, if you haven't been confronted with this kind of issue, where is that temptation likely to be the, uh, the greatest? There are many aspects of, uh, of government policy. Uh, it can affect many uh, uh, um, places in the economy. Well, it, it's the temptation theoretically would be greatest where the government can tax something that has already been accumulated. Uh, something that was accumulated to have benefits to the, uh, to the accumulator uh, for many years into the future. That, that's where future policy uh, has the greatest impact on earlier decisions. Um, and in particular, it could hit uh, it, 
in particular, tax on physical and human capital would be candidate, or uh, or uh, or to tax uh, the the government debt, which many Latin American American countries became experts at. Uh, the way they accomplished that was by engineering uh, a surprise inflation, sometimes to the extent that we refer to it as a hyperinflation. So that's a way to renege, or partially at least renege, on the government debt. Um, you may ask, what's the intu intuition for, for this result? It's a, it's a little complicated to, to, uh, to explain, but uh, let me just give it a, a, quick, uh, a quick shot. So I, I made a big point out of future policy, for example, future tax policy potentially affecting current decisions. If you know today that tax policy will be stable and uh, reasonably low, for example, uh, as it affects uh, uh, physical capital, that could be a boost to, uh, to the inv investment environment. Uh, but suppose you get into the future, these factories have already been built on the assumption that the tax environment, tax environment will be benign. Suppose uh, the government is, uh, at least claims they're faced with some emergency. The temptation would be to increase taxes on, on, on this capital that has already been built. Um, in this optimal plan I was talking about, um, that plan took into account the effect future policy has on earlier decisions. Once they have been made, then if you sat down and recalculated that plan from this point on, um, the incentives would no longer be there to take into account the effect on decisions already been made. So, um, so there is this need for um, a commitment mechanism, and the ones that have been used in practice are almost all in the arena of monetary policy. Uh, there's a very old example, the gold standard, and uh, I could talk about that for five minutes, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip that. The, the currency board is kind of interesting. It's, um, it, it was tried by Argentina after an awful decade, the last decade in Argentina in the 1980s. Carlos Menem came to power, and he decided to try to shore up investor um, confidence by um, by tying the peso, the Argentine peso, to the dollar one, one for one. They accumulated enough, enough re reserves so that this seemed like a credible policy. And uh, it did seem to work pretty well for a while, for a number of years, but then everything uh, fell apart. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that example once I show uh, a picture for Argentina and, and talk a little bit more, more about it then. The, the most successful commitment mechanism, this is the one uh, most often referred to, is an independent central bank. So that's a way to isolate monetary policy from, uh, from um, political pressure uh, to try to uh, maintain a benign monetary policy over time uh, in the face of pressure from, uh, from, uh, policy, from other policy makers. Uh, and, and it is an established empirical regularity that monetary policy is more benign in countries where the central bank is more independent. The Bundesbank in uh, Germany uh, used to be the master of transparency and, uh, and, and uh, consistency. Um, the, uh, the, um, 
the United States uh, Central Bank is fairly independent. Uh, in Britain, the Central Bank became, was made independent in 1997. If you talk to uh, Central Bank heads in uh, Scandinavia, they will all say that, yeah, this is, it's in, their independence is, is, um, is very important. Then you have the contrast with uh, some countries, for example, in Latin America. Um, one, one aspect of, of uh, an um, independent central bank uh, with great transparency is the head tends to sit for quite a while. It tends to uh, be the head uh, across different, um, different um, um, either presidents or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or different administrations. Um, typically in the United States, he might sit for 12 years. In fact, if you go back 50 years, there have only, only been, I'm sorry, 60 years, you go back to about 1950, there's been only six heads of the Federal Reserve Bank of, uh, uh, of the United States. If you take Argentina, for example, uh, just for fun, I counted the number of, uh, of heads of its central bank. I went back to 1945. Uh, that's a period of 67 years. And um, guess how many heads have been uh, They've been in Argentina over that 67-year period. Quick guess. 100. <laughs> uh, no, um, not that bad, but uh, bad enough. 54. So that means that the average head sat for one and a quarter years. There was an especially tumultuous period in Argentina in 2002 when the head changed three times in one year. Uh, the government wants the uh, central bank head to do something. He refuses, out he goes. Um, you may remember the news a couple of years ago. Uh, after uh, about 2002, then for, uh, the same head sat for, uh, for a few years, Martin Redrado. Um, but then in, um, in uh, 2010, Cristina uh, Fernandez Kirchner decided she wanted her hands on, on the reserves of the central bank. Uh, the head refused and it was fired and uh, Cristina got her hands on the reserves. Um, so. As I said, these are, these are all examples in the Monterey arena, but it's, the difficulty is there's no, there's no obvious way to commit to good fiscal policy. And, and uh, that's, a, uh, it's, that's a key problem. Now, let, let's just look at Argentina. So this is on proportional scale. Um, the, uh, the uh, scale on the vertical axis is uh, in logs of GDP. That's how we make it on proportional scale. Proportional scale meaning that a straight line, for example, the one you show there, uh, corresponds to a constant growth rate, whether you're uh, towards the bottom or the, uh, the top of the picture. And you can see uh, um, how terrible uh, the, nine, the 80s were for Argentina. I guess you guys can't see where I'm pointing. So, <laughs> uh, If you can read the log scale, uh, then, then you can see that the drop in real GDP per capita or, or per working age person was more than 20% over that 10-year period. Then, uh, the, uh, then it grew for, for uh, about eight years, and then everything fell apart again. Another drop of more than 20%, and this time in, uh, in a much shorter period, four or five years. Uh, so so this, this period of, of growth from about 1990, that's the one I was talking about, where Carlos Menem came to power and instituted the currency board. 
What they forgot to uh, do was shore up the uh, fiscal environment, especially as it related to the provinces. The provinces, it turned out, were able to, uh, to, to keep borrowing, uh, to increase their debt in spite of seemingly good times. Uh, and then it became clear the provinces would not be able to pay back their debt. They came running to the federal government who were obliged to take over and then everything unraveled. Um, Argentina has seemingly done pretty well recently, but they've been lucky because uh, prices of, the, of soybeans, of uh, other resources of which uh, the country is rich, uh, have, uh, have been high. This is uh, one of the, occasionally I, I see a depressing picture, and this is one of the more depressing pictures I've seen. This is the capital stock per working age person for Argentina. As you can see, the peak is in uh, about 1981-82. That's amazing. I mean, uh, a well-functioning economy, the capital stock should keep growing, more or less in line with that straight line you see. Um, and, and this this sort of situation has predictable implications, low uh, real wages for the average person, rising poverty rates, and so on. Um, even, even in the seemingly good time of the, uh, let's say, the past eight or nine years, the capital stock has not recovered to its previous uh, peak which suggests that if, if uh, prices were to fall for Argentina's resources, its project, products, its uh, agricultural products and so on, Argentina would be in deep trouble again. And there are signs these days that it is, that, that it's running into great difficulties. Um, so this, this is what I would regard as the main uh, explanation for these episodes in Argentina, that Argentina suffered from what I would call the time inconsistency disease due to people's memories of uh, past bad policy. As you can see, uh, when, uh, when you have uh, hyperinflations like Argentina had uh, towards the end of the 80s, lots of people, pen pensioners, uh, uh, assets just evaporate. Uh, they lose uh, most of what they had saved. Now, let me uh, switch to uh, give, uh, giving Europe a little at attention. So, so um, at the top of this picture, most of it, you have countries like Denmark, France, United Kingdom uh, doing pretty well, and then uh, more towards the bottom, countries like um, Greece, Spain, and Ireland doing not so well. Um, in 1990, suddenly one of those bottom countries take off. And uh, before you know it, it has overtaken all of these other countries in terms of real GDP per capita, and, and that's Ireland. Um, I, I'll say a little bit, well, okay, let, let, may as well uh, finish the uh, Ireland. So Ireland, um, they, they had a reasonably uh, good precondition in, in about 1990. They had made secondary education free of charge in the late 60s, early 70s. They found themselves about 1990 with a potentially skillful workforce, but no factories in which to work, uh, to speak of. So then Ireland decided, we'll make 
tax policy completely predictable. The tax environment was benign, not particularly high taxes. And moreover, Ireland said, if you, whether you're a foreigner or, or uh, Irish, if you invest in Ireland, you build productive capacity here, your tax rate in 1992 will be so-and-so, in 1993, all the way to 2009. And uh, I guess Ireland has no, uh, no, had no history of tricking people, so this was, uh, this was a believable policy. And you see uh, what happened. Unfortunately, the end of the story is not as good as it could have been because when the financial crisis hit in 2008, um, towards the end of this very good period, let's say st uh, starting around 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, the, the Irish banks got tempted to issue a lot of ill-advised, Ill uh, for example, mortgages and, and other construction kind of loans. Uh, when the crisis hit, they were in big trouble and uh, almost like a panic decision, the uh, Prime Minister decided to bail out the banks. A huge blunder in my opinion because that saddled taxpayers with huge amount of debt. And that has cost Ireland ever since. Um, still doing reasonably well compared to uh, many European countries. Um, the, as you know, the Eurozone has, has had its difficulties, uh, or, or maybe the European Union more generally, and what became clear was something analogous to the situation in, in, uh, in um, Argentina, where uh, the Eurozone was pretty clear about their policy. They created a, a central bank, uh, a common currency, but was, what was not clear was the fiscal environment in, in, um, in this zone. And uh, again, my, my view is that that was the main source of the difficulties that have have uh, befell uh, the Euro Eurozone. Uh, just to sh show you one uh, more depressing picture, so if you paid attention to the, uh, the scale of the, of the first two graphs I had, you would remember that it went from zero to $40,000 GDP per capita. This picture goes to only to $10,000. Uh, and only because I decided to include one more resource-rich nation, namely um, Botswana. Um, the other countries have uh, uh, had very depressing histories uh, for years and years, in, in many cases decades. There are cases where there's, uh, there's some hope, and then everything fell, falls apart. And much of this must have to do with bad policy or, or bad confidence in, in those nations. Um, if, if someone could, um, in either one of these nations, could do something about the institu institutional environment, uh, all of these presumably would have great potential. <coughs> It remains to be seen if, if that will happen. Um, let me just say a few words about uh, the United States as well. Uh, so, so here's a picture of the log of real GDP per capita since 1947. Uh, a straight line through that picture, that is a constant growth rate line, does pretty well to account for the long-run growth of the nation. There are ups and downs, of course. That's what we call business cycles. But, uh, but by and large, the nation has, has grown at, at about that rate, about 2% uh, 
or slightly over 2% per year. Now, the, uh, the, the biggest drop you see in that picture is that for around 2008, 2009. And just to um, um, emphasize that period, let's blow that, that last portion of the gra gra graph up so that you can see uh, more clearly. Um, and, and again, if, you, if you're good at reading uh, log scale, you, you can pretty much tell that that decline be below, the, be, below the straight line trend is on the order of 12%, 11 or 12%. That's a huge drop. And uh, even worse, there doesn't seem to be any tendency to move back towards the old trend. If anything, uh, that seeming new trend is uh, diverging slightly from, uh, from the old trend. Um, I have a, a co-author at the Dallas Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank of, of Dallas, um, where I've uh, consulted for, for a few years. We have a paper in which we suggest that a main reason for that big drop and the fact that we're not approach, uh, the new trend is not showing much inclination to move back towards the old one has to do with forward-looking businesses. Uh, the drop has been especially great in investment, much more so than in consumption. Um, so we did the experiment of just setting up a basic growth model, um, trying to account for the United States since 2008, um, in which the idea is that, especially after the stimulus package, all the talk about the government debt in, in the United States growing dramatically, that people became concerned about who's going to pay for this debt. And the time and consistency insights suggest that those uh, with capital income should be, whether it's f from physical capital or from human capital, they should be most nervous about that. Suppose they are nervous about that. Suppose uh, they de decided around 2008, 2009 that uh, taxes, capital income taxes were likely to go up by enough to keep the debt from rising further. Let's say they were, might go up, at, we made the assumption as of January 1st, 2013. That model accounts well for what has happened to investment over that period. It accounts pretty well for consumption and most seriously it suggests that it will take a long time for the economy to recover back to the old friend. Um, the, um, the slope of that new trend is on the order of, remember this was uh, a picture in real GDP, not per capita. The, uh, the trend has been about 2% uh, over the past two years. Uh, I forgot to, uh, to take into account that we just got the numbers for the fourth quarter, which was real GDP declined by 0.1%, uh, not, not a good sign. 2% uh, growth in real GDP per capita with uh, almost 1% growth in the population. That suggests that the trend is only 1% versus the 2% for the straight line trend that I talk about. They are, they have been diverging uh, since, uh, since uh, 2009. Um, so I've talked a lot about the importance of policy consistency. But you have to remember one thing uh, about that policy and about the re result to which I was referring. I used the word optimal which uh, in uh, realistic terms you could, uh, could uh, interpret as good policy. 
a good forward-looking policy. You might argue that China um, carries out a consistent policy. I regard China as an example of the following. Consistent policy is not sufficient for uh, good outcomes. Um, it, if it's not close to being, uh, if it's not a good policy, then even if it's consistent, it's, it's not, it doesn't need to, uh, to lead to good outcomes. I regard China as such an example, and this is something I learned from an article in, uh, in uh, the American Ec Economic Review, the, uh, maybe the main economics journal by uh, Chetel Storsletten and two of his co-authors. Uh, the, the title of the article is Growing Like China. And, and what they point out is in China, um, banks are run by the government. M most banks are state-owned and they tend to favor state-owned the state, big state-owned uh, companies. So here you have these companies with uh, easy access to credit, so far easy access to uh, cheap labor. They have been able to show considerable profits without needing to be particularly innovative. Um, in the meantime, the main engines of growth of nations, most nations, the ones who will make decisions showing up as the, my Z growing over time, they have a hard time getting loans. They may have good ideas about uh, new products, new processes, and so on, but they are typically forced to save up in advance of putting their ideas into to fruition. Uh, and, uh, and also as a consequence of difficulty of, of getting such loans, they, they get biased towards more labor intensive activities than otherwise. So um, because China started at such a low level, they seemingly they have uh, done reasonably well, but I think that this problem will come back to haunt them unless they increase competition in the financial sector. Just to show how important the financial sector is, here's a, here's a picture from uh, uh, comparing two fairly similar countries, Mexico and Chile after a crisis about 1980-81. So around that time both of those countries were faced with very low prices of their main products. Copper in the case of Chile, oil in the case of Mexico. Because of uh, those low prices and also high world interest rates, uh, for example in Chile, banks accounting for half of its deposits were illiquid. The government stepped in, decided which banks were uh, viable for the long run, the rest of the, the remain, remaining banks were closed. Um, within two or three years, uh, the, uh, the viable banks were allowed to uh, reprivatize. Markets started functioning, credit started flowing to the most productive users as much as uh, the banking system can do. Uh, at the high cost initially, as you can see from this picture, GDP per capita dropped about 15% in two years, uh, but then the country started growing. In Mexico, um, something similar happened, except the banks were not, the, uh, the remaining banks were not reprivatized. 
government bureaucrats were in charge of, of giving the loans or deciding who got the loans. Uh, and it's not always the case that government bureaucrats know best where the best uses of funds are. Um, as you can see, Mexico kept languishing for, for years. Eventually they did reprivatize the banking sector and Mexico has been doing better more recently. Um, <coughs> there, there's, um, you know, on, on this issue of time and consistency, I, I said uh, on the third slide, I believe, that I would uh, talk about Norway. I, I don't know, maybe I don't have time for that, or, uh, I pardon? Some people that classes at one o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, st I'll still like to give that example because uh, Norway is an oil rich country, and so uh, maybe uh, around here you would enjoy that example. In, um, in 2007, I was part of a, a panel to evaluate solutions to. Uh, Latin American problems. And uh, one of the uh, solution areas that we discussed was democracy. Uh, and, and one of the proposed solutions was the following. Increase the level of party, and political party and party system institutionalization. Well, I, I didn't quite understand uh, what that meant, so uh, so I told the uh, the uh, the person who presented that solution, uh, you know, an expert. Uh, I asked, so to understand this solution, um, is this similar to the following? Norway was lucky enough to find oil in the early 70s. They decided after less than 10 years to save most of the revenue, most of the income from, uh, from the oil for future ge generations. They instituted a policy rule that said how much of government oil revenue could be used in any given year. Over the next 30 year period, there were several uh, 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 administrations of Norway, they're from the Labour Party, more leftist uh, administration, to a more uh, rightist coalition of, of, of uh, parties in, in charge. They never touched that decision rule. So the, uh, this uh, expert said, yes, that's, that's uh, that's uh, part of what I'm referring to. In particular, in uh, Chile, they have a similar kind of uh, fund they have, that's called the Copper Fund. And they've also been successful in, uh, for the government to, to uh, keep from using it for short-run uh, expenditures. If it had been if the copper fund had been in the hand of the Argentines, he would have been gone in a jiffy. So, the point of that story is, it says something about the institutions of nations. There's something that will make policy consistency more likely in some nations that, than in others. Uh, I think uh, of this as a in, very interesting subject to study. Uh, for political scientists or economists and so on. Uh, in the case, even in the case of the United States, uh, with the difficulty of making fiscal policy credible, um, this is worth thinking about. Now, sometimes I have crazy ideas. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, writing a, uh, a journal uh, op-ed article that suggests that there should be a fourth branch of the government. And that fourth branch would be in charge of fiscal policy to make a fiscal policy 
uh, predictable, transparent, much more important than to have a, a special branch or special institution taking care of monetary policy. Uh, well, my, my, my summary, I guess, is pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I think there are significant risks in, in the economy these days. I'm a little bit pessimistic because of my, my understanding of the time and consistency issue. I'm not very pessimistic that policymakers will, uh, will improve much in the, uh, in the next three or four years. Um, Uh, my, my wife, uh, for some reason, she, she loves uh, some things I say more than others. And, and uh, one thing she really enjoyed was this statement that there's enough uncertainty in the world as is. We don't need extra uncertainty coming from the government. Uh, my wife turns out to be a very smart person, and uh, I think that's a uh, that's about the the uh, most important conclusion um, one can draw. But to solve that problem of, of of avoiding that uncertainty, it it's not going to be easy. Thank you very much for listening to me. I think that those are good examples of what I'm referring to. Um, those are examples of, of see, the way um, this time and consistency problem is likely to manifest itself in practice is the government tends to, ha to worry about the short run. That's typical for Argentina, it's typical for, for the countries that uh, have not done so well. Um, forgetting that it's important to have the right incentives in place for, for the long run, uh, the examples you gave, um, it, it may have seemed like the right thing to do by politicians at the time, but the big problem with those decisions is the incentives the perception about what's going to happen in the future. And, and for that reason, uh, the effect it will have on, on decisions that, that affect, say, the likelihood of another bank getting into trouble or another country getting into trouble in the future. And so I, I would say it, it would, it, you could you could say that well uh, exposed uh, GM now is making profits. This looks like a, a good decision. Well, GM would have recovered. It, 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 they would have uh, resurfaced under no, new ownership. Meantime, the uh, the uh, incentives uh, of uh, carrying out the, these decisions, I, I think, uh, are quite bad. And also, in the case of Greece, the uh, the incentives for for the behavior of, uh, say, Portugal and uh, Spain and uh, Italy and so on after this happened. Yeah, Pat. Um, I suppose, loosely speaking, you can say the difference between countries where they have good consistency and those that don't are those that are good long run, have a good long run view and plan that way, mm -hmm. and those who are just sort of seeking the short term payoff. Right. Um, and the difference between the two sounds like could be attributed to differences in the incentives of the government decision makers. It sounded like you made a first step towards 
making a comment about how we modify these incentives when you talked about the fourth branch of government. Um, you want to elaborate a little bit on how you, how you see that we might be able to positively impact the incentives of the government policy makers? Well, the, it, it's not going to be so... Uh, so see, the uh, in, incentives for policy makers seem to be all wrong. Um, suppose in the, let, let's take the case of the United States. Suppose uh, uh, politicians uh, propose some project. Uh, it, it's almost as if there's a free lunch because it's not clear who's going to pay for this uh, project, which, which taxes will have to go up in the future. If we, if we could set up a system so that um, in order to um, be able to put through some major project, project you, you have to say where, where is the financing going to come from? Which tax will uh, have to go up in say two years in order to, to pay for it? Uh, then, then it's much more likely they would think about it. Uh, this, I don't regard it uh, as very likely that that kind of uh, ins institutional arrangement will go through in practice. A and that's why, that's why I was, to, to, to put it uh, very starkly, that's why I would uh, say, well, we, we need something similar to the, uh, to the uh, Fed carrying out monetary policy, we need something in the, in the fiscal arena. Uh, I wish that were more realistic than I'm worried about, but, uh, but it's a way to, uh, to emphasize, at least for me, even if it's not particularly um, uh, likely to happen in practice, it would be a way to emphasize this, this is where uh, the important uh, decisions affecting long-run growth are coming from, a and uh, and uh, anything that can be done to to change that institutional environment in the right direction would uh, would be a good thing. The the um, the debt problem in the United States has been boiling uh, uh, for uh, well, some people would say since the early 70s, where uh, which is when. Um, um, when revenues, uh, when expenditures started rising more than revenues, and that's a situation that has persisted ever since, with the exception of a portion of the 90s, um, with the uh, baby boomers retiring, and, and uh, it's, it's a clear prediction, it's easy to predict that their uh, demand on the government budget through uh, Medicare and so on, Social Security. Uh, it's been known well before 2008 that that would be a, a difficult problem for, for the U.S. government. Then on top of that comes the spending in 2008-2009 uh, to, to make the debt balloon. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm serious about this, this view that um, it's unlikely that we will move back to the old trend quick, quickly before the, uh, before the fiscal environment get, gets clarified. things I can in, uh, let's say, in a, in a research paper. Um, in part because I regard it as terribly important 
the fact that Chile can do so much be better in in uh, in a serious situation than uh, Mexico, and the fact that Chile is so different from Argentina, it's unbelievable the the um, the number of unwise or I would say ridiculous policy decisions being made by Argentina, and one. Uh, may wonder what it is about the political system in Argentina, about their institutions, that makes that happen. Uh, to, to get a clear answer of that, would uh, that we, would be a great boon to the profession and our understanding of, of uh, what's likely to promote growth of nations. I won't pretend that I know the answer to that. Um, I could refer you to um, to the paper uh, to which I was referring, uh, where this potential solution came about uh, at this panel in, uh, in, in uh, to evaluate Latin American uh, solutions. I've been a member of a panel uh, several times to evaluate solutions to world problems. It's it's something carried out. These panels are run by something called the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Um, three times at four-year intervals, they've ha had meetings to evaluate solutions to world problems, according to benefit-cost analysis. Uh, position papers by experts in different areas. The uh, the one who did democracy when it came to Latin America, I believe his name is Mark Jones. His paper can be found on the website of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. And um, I recommend you read that paper because he, he, he provides an uh, evaluation from his political science perspective for the importance, the benefits, and the cost of, uh, of increasing, uh, as he said, the level of political party and party, party system institutionalization. And it gives some ideas how, how, how that would be done in, in practice. As a country, we have a lot of the things that you talked about policy with respect to the dollar. We have an 80% expat labor force, and of course, we have significant growth. I'm very curious, looking at your examples, especially the last one on Norway with oil resources. With our dependency on expats and talking about obviously we're using this for a faster growth, what is your advice for countries country to look at uh, consistencies for policy of growth and this uh, dependence on expat factors to try and rapidly generate that growth? Any particular differences in regards to how we would manage that towards the Well, um, <clears throat> so, so I haven't been long enough here to uh, know in detail uh, the issues in Qatar. The example I would like to mention is, um, and uh, I went over it quickly because I predicted I wouldn't have much time, but I let, let me get back to two countries that I had in the first picture, Kazakhstan and uh, Azerbaijan. So they, these are also uh, nations rich in resources. Oil in both cases, but also uh, metals and so on. And both nations have managed to, they have managed their, uh, this richness pretty well. As you can see from the picture, the, the, the growth has been uh, considerable. Both of these nations, and they, uh, they, uh, they agree to that themselves, they are facing a, an important bottleneck, namely, having grown so fast um, to pro promote, to continue that growth, they need skillful people to, uh, you know, to carry out tasks. And, and, they, and that's the biggest bottleneck. The, uh, the, um, the uh, getting with the right skills. 
And so the way they um, try to solve that problem, more, than, more so than they don't seem to be in a position to, uh, to import foreign, uh, foreign workers, but they're trying their, their best to, uh, to improve the educational uh, system as fast as they ca can by creating new uh, uh, universities, by giving resources to the existing universities so that uh, people, the average skill level of their uh, um, population can be improved so that the growth can continue. Um, of course, that slow moving process is not something you can do uh, overnight. And so I suppose an alternative to, uh, to doing so is to uh, rely more on um, immigrants or, or uh, maybe either temporary or permanently. Um, I, uh, as long as, as that's a uh, transparent policy and every, everyone un understands why it's being done, you know, that's, that seems fair enough. Uh, it's not so clear there's much connection between the issue and, and the uh, policy inconsistency per se.